So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Oh, that's a delicious beer we're drinking today, Michael. What's that called? We're drinking a Citrus Twist Dang IPA from Hellbent Brewing Company. And there is an exclamation after dang if you want to really lean into that. What if I call it damn? <laughs> damn good. <laughs> damn good. Very tasty. Uh, so we're doing some Rain Dance Film Festival coverage today. Rain Dance is a film festival out of the UK. Um, kind of an up and coming festival that seems to be getting more and more traction here as the years go on. They're doing a kind of virtual and various in-person cinema, um, brief screenings. Um, today our selections from there is going to be He Dreams of Giants, detailing the story of Terry Gilliam succeeding to make the man who killed Don Quixote for, you know, the first time in his life in 20 years. A Dim Valley, about a group of biologist students and a biologist teacher who uh, smoke some weed and have some encounters uh, that might be best described as magical realism. And then we finish it up with Nafi's father, which is a story about um, a, a slow, gradual descent into uh, kind of a militaristic state based on religion. That's right. Two smaller budget independent features and a dock. So a nice little bit of variety. Uh, should be fun. Yeah. And instead of covering some prestige films f from streaming giant Amazon Prime Video, Michael, we're throwing things up for the first time in a month. We're going to cover some prestige films from Netflix. That's right. We're going to watch trailers for Hillbilly Elegy as well as Marini's Black Bottom. Let's start with Hillbilly Elegy, directed by Ron Howard. All right. Daddy, don't look at that. Come on. Come on. Don't you look at You look at me. And you look at me. You let her get away with this every time. I told you that I would do better. You always say that. You're and lying. I always try. You got to think about these kids. What do you think I've been thinking about since I was 18 years old, huh? Never had a life where I wasn't thinking about the kids. Do you actually want to be dead, Mom? Or are you just too lazy to try? Jamie. Oh, I tried! Plenty! You've always got a reason. It's always someone else's fault. Some point, you're gonna have to take responsibility, or someone else what? is gonna have to step in. Who? Ha huh? who? You? All right, we just watched the trailer for Hillbilly Elegy, starring Glenn Close. Amy Adams, Haley Bennett, directed by Ron Howard. What do you think? Well, I think on a sliding scale here, Michael, this is a prestige film, which would almost always be a disappointment. And comparing it to other prestige films of its ilk, I think I'm interested. I think I will likely come out neutral to the lowest version of positive on it. Mm. You know, like maybe a three, probably mm. a two and a half with the heart is my guess. Um, this type of adaptation of emotional novels that have the giant white text that says New York Times bestseller and adaption of a memoir. That stuff always generally rubs me the wrong way. Um, I, I wasn't aware this was an adaptation. I thought it was kind of more of a heartfelt original screenplay. Mm. Um but the, the character work that I saw from Glenn Close looks really interesting. I'm always there to see Amy Adams, you know, take a big swing. Um, but I'm lukewarm. How about you? Yeah, I think the chances that I'll watch this are low. It does strike me as pretty shameless Oscar bait. The sentiment, the sentimentality just feels egregiously over the top. That could just be the marketing and the manufacturing of the trailer, but... I do not care for the lack of idiosyncrasy it seems to have. And I really don't like what it looks like Glenn Close is doing. To me, that really? 
Not at all. These are the kinds of performances that always seem to get awards attention. And to me, it's just kind of the quirk of applauding performances, which is that like the best ones are the ones that make it look really easy. And they, as a result, often go unnoticed because it just seems so instantly believable and organic versus these kinds of performances that just seem so effortful and and hammy and scenery chewing. I, I'm not really excited that Amy Adams keeps doing these kinds of movies. I'd much rather see her do something with a more distinctive kind of flavor or tone. Um, I don't know. And I'm also just kind of begrudge it for just pushing its way into the awards conversation, just merely based on its stars and release date. Like, I don't, I don't think we should let that dictate what we end up watching if, if it just looks bad. I, I don't think it just looks bad. I don't think this is a case of the goldfinch. I think this is a, mm. a little bit more earnest than that. Um, and yeah, I, I think that I just see it a little bit more positively than you. I, I have a warm spot in my heart for Ron Howard um, and Haley Bennett's pretty darn great. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd say that I am more skeptical of most of the digital prestige movies that we've previewed um and and maybe i'm just a little bit more defensive on this one because i i i don't know i think this is different than a lot of other prestige releases uh or prestige trailers that i've seen this year like at least this is trying to do something different different how different than what is contemporarily being kind of just printed out with you know, dark city streets and rain and, and music mm. and uh, some some smoke and some lip gloss and nice outfits at, at nighttime. Mm. Like that's that's just kind of what we're about to get for two months. That sounds great, actually, to me. This feels more <laughs> like the green book of the year, which I still haven't seen, still have no interest in seeing just some broad sentimentality about Americans, you know, overcoming difficulties um overcoming hardship with just really really broad generalizations of emotion I don't, again it's all from the trailer itself but um you know lots of movies to see i don't have much interest in seeing this just because of the awards potential when yeah. there's so many more personalized bolder visions out there yeah i i certainly don't want to see this because of the possibility it could be nominated for an award and i think we all are grading on a scale this year knowing that the green knight zola minari last night in soho dune the french dispatch you go on they all got pushed there's a there's a lot of other movies that could be getting awards so i i'm just trying to maybe judge this as itself not as the awards that it could get fair um fair. Let's get on to a prestige release that's a little bit more dark, smoky, and nighttime oriented with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. A one, a two, a you know what to do. This would be an empty world without the blues. I try to take that emptiness and fill it up with something. But they want to call me Mother Blues. That's all right with me. It don't hurt none. <laughs> Way down south and a Where's the, uh, the horn player? I got a friend. Come on, Levy. You rehearse like everybody else. I'm going to get me a band and make me some records. I know how to play real music, not this jug band shit. You call that playing music? Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Go on and fire me, I don't care. When I got there, they began to say. That's to get the people's attention. That's when you and Slow Drag come in with the rhythm part. Me and Cutler play on the break. All right, Michael, that was George C. Scott's trailer for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. What do you think? Well, I think some of the things I said about Hillbilly Elegy still apply here. It still feels like quite clearly Oscar bait. I think just the the period setting, music, uh, all the visual detail of the era is just naturally much more appealing to me. I still wouldn't describe it as, 
you know, having any more idiosyncrasy than Hillbilly Elegy, but this seems a little bit more suited to my taste. Um, still can't say I'm just, like, super excited for it. What about you? Super excited now. This is not a, a trailer that, that excites me very deeply. I do really like what I'm seeing out of Yola Davis here. Um, it's a very interesting character and in turn for her to have the opportunity to play. Are, are you reacting like you did to Glenn Close with Viola Davis here? Or, or are you liking what you're seeing? Uh, no, no. I, I think I like what I'm seeing here more than in Glenn Close's okay, performance. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's smoky, jazzy, um, classic tale of, you know, the the musical group in the 30s or 40s, whatever time period we're in here. Um, I don't really get a sense for what the film is actually about. Me neither. Um, but I, I'm i more than thrilled to be able to go to see it in a theater in a week and see the the smoke and the, the jazz and watch a Chad Boswick performance and Viola Davis performance that are kind of big and just, you know, go luxuriate in its flaws as well as its strengths. Yeah. Who knows what the Oscars will actually look like this year, assuming they do some kind of virtual thing, but you can imagine this being the kind of movie that normally would have some kind of song performed from yes. it. Yes. I don't yeah, know. Some sort of a push. Well, maybe we'll get a Zoom performance of some kind. Who knows? Yeah. I think that I got the memo that normal people want everything already. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we, we just Early moved, word. It, moved it to a movie. <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. We recently joined as members, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. Well, with that, let's get on to He Dreams of Giants about Terry Gilliam's story making The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. You've got to be possessed to want to continue making a movie under those kind of circumstances. Yeah, the problem is once you start on these things, it's hard to stop. Oh, no. Oh. What is the attraction of the tale of Don Quixote? I mean, why persist? The whole idea is to go out and try to do the thing that everybody says you can't do. Oh, fuck. The weather's gonna kill us. Clouds have come in. Wind's howling. Well, I'm here to suffer. I'm here. To suffer like Coyote. Cut! Once again! How many times is one in the sand? Let's just get the shot. We don't need a horse. We don't need a horse, we need actors! Actors! The man who killed Don Quixote was in your top 10, if I remember correctly, from 2018? Or was that 2017? It must have been 2018. I believe it was last year. Was that was it last year? I believe it was. Time moves weird in 2020. I believe it was in my best of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was like number seven. I, I will go ahead and pull that up for you. Just to confirm its place. But you have, you have not seen The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. That's right. So we are coming at this from two very different perspectives, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Um... We both, from what I gather, liked this documentary. I gave it a four and a half out of five. Where, where did you end up uh, landing on it with a rating? Uh, I don't know how relevant my rating is when I haven't seen the movie. So my enthusiasm is just not going to get that high to begin with. Three, three and a half, probably. Like, okay. it's it's not one, you know, I have any reason to, to revisit necessarily or anything like that. That's sort of what gets me into a four or, a, or above out of five stars, that is. So, yeah, somewhere in there. But I enjoyed it. I liked it. Good. So, a small update. It is number 10, sandwiched between Dragged Across Concrete and Fosse Verdon. Oh, it just barely squeaked in. Just barely squeaked in, but I sure did love it. And did this deepen your affection for the movie itself? It not only... Well, I, I don't know that it really did deepen my affection for that particular film so much as the story and the lore of the film and it deepened my appreciation of terry gilliam himself uh just watching a man 
say that he thinks he needs dialysis and you kind of go that's a very specific thing to say and then within 10 minutes have him have a catheter attached to his leg filled with bloody fluid at his ankle um and seeing him hike up giant rocky hills in the blistering sun and wind to make this this vision that he's had um, for at least 20 years, if not 30, is just there's something very moving about it, um, if if that makes sense. That answers the question. <laughs> yeah, the bag was pretty gnarly looking. He was determined to stay out there. That yes. was pretty cool. Um, I think my fear going into the documentary, seeing that the two co-directors, Keith Fulton and Louis, or Louis Pepe, Knowing that they had previously worked with Gilliam or had maybe collaborated with them in the past or starting some of his movies was that it was that it would feel too much like just a patting on his back for the unwillingness to give up over so many years. But it very much it did not feel like that. Um, I think it felt more just like a celebration of his dedication to the project. Um, and that's um, really fun. I mean, I do think if someone has a sensitivity to bias in documentary filmmaking that you might wonder if there was ever any willingness to show anything that would put him in a more negative light. It doesn't that doesn't bother me too much, um, but probably just worth noting. Generally speaking, though, I think it is a very friendly and um, complimentary project towards him and his um, vision. Yeah, I, I think I go with you there. I, I would definitely describe it more as the, not only about the man who killed Don Quixote finally coming to fruition, but the story of a curmudgeon just not stopping being a curmudgeon until the thing is done. Um, I, I don't feel like it was too biased because there is just so much negativity supercut of Terry screaming mm. fuck and yelling mm. and and being upset and, and yelling at the whole cast and crew. Um, so, I, I mean, maybe there's something worse hiding in the footage, but mm. I, I don't get the sense that they were really sugarcoating it. But they, they do structure the documentary to feel uplifting by the end, for sure. But mm. I don't get the sense that it was like... Um, going out of its way to be non-objective and paint him in a favorable light or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Um, it's those little moments where you see like the cinematographer in, in particular looking very discouraged kind of off to the side, you know, you wonder like how many people over the years did not have fun on this project because of how grueling or arduous of a process this was. Um, it very much sticks to his perspective and congratulates his, dedication which i think it it does well um just just a, a general thought i think not something that bothered me too yeah specifically i guess yeah i i feel like we did get to know the cinematographer over the the period of it as well and that w without him terry certainly could not have pulled the film off he he was really leaning on him quite hard um for assistance with with doing the shots and everything and, and watching there's that one particular scene where he just cannot figure out how to work a walkie-talkie. Oh, that was a great bit. And yeah. he storms down this hiking trail and yells at a cinematographer. It is, it is so excellent. Um, that was one of my favorite bits for sure. And and then there's those small like uplifting beats where um you know they hit shooting day seven and that's a landmark event because he mm -hmm. only made it to day six before. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot here. Um. What do you think of the archival footage seeing Johnny Depp clasp mm. in in the, uh, God, what is the even term for that? It was a, a wooden contraption imprisoning his, his head and his uh, wrists. I don't know what the proper term yeah, for that is. Yeah, everybody's seen that device in a history book or whatever. I don't know what the name of that is. But, Normally um, it stalks when you're like in a village square. They could throw tomatoes it, at you or something. Yes, but these are like stocks that are small miniature Portable. connected by chains <laughs> where you can move so i don't yeah. know what that's called yeah yeah it is fun to see the different iterations of the project over over time yeah the johnny depp stuff uh sticks out especially just just because of who he is um yeah all that's very fun to see and i think you get a good sense of what the project means to him and i think that's especially of note because 
I think it's kind of revealed that he can't articulate himself very well, like what it is about this project that he can't quite give up. And it has more to just do with this kind of irrational artistic obsession that, um, you know, is hard to really pin down. That's just something deep inside that you, you can't let go of until it's out there and, and available for the world. For the world. Um, I think that night very nicely comes across. Yeah. So the, I, I mean, he says in the first 20 minutes when he's um, kind of, in interacting with I, I don't really know the proper way to put it that original Don Quixote book where you see him mm. rub his finger on the, the stencil and you can just sense the love that he has rubbing his finger there he describes Don Quixote as a as a man whose body is failing him who mm. has the passion in, in um, aliveness um, for making and doing that a young man has mm-hmm. and that you know I I kept coming back to watching this film i i do feel like watching terry was like watching don quixote who has this old failing body who in the documentary is literally failing on him and this passion for this when you when you see him shrouded in that that black uh shawl holding the monitor up to his Mm. face um there there's just so much aliveness to him in those those singular moments or the joy that he gets from watching adam driver stab the uh the windmill um mm. that i think it, it really brings that point to life that the the point that he's trying to make with the film about the old body failing and mm. um in, in absence of the passion that it has yeah the the moments where you can tell he is finally genuinely satisfied with whatever he's got you know he lets out those little like high higher pitched chuckles that just carry so much joy and they really suggest that it's not just because he's stubborn or can't let it go that he um is still working on this it's because he truly has fun doing it and it's so satisfying when he finally gets it um and there's a nice balance i think of the scenes where we really see that joy in having a successful shot versus the the really intense frustration when things are just not coming together or not moving fast enough. Um, you see it when he's um, wincing or just like trying to close his eyes and like tune everything out for a moment. You can tell he's just ready to burst and he does burst sometimes, but there's a nice balance, I think, of uh, frustration with with satisfaction. Yeah, and I think that there's also a nice balance of the art as we get in the latter half of the film, young Terry in interview segments being cut Mm. in against older Terry and seeing the same person there, uh, but a little bit more world weary, but still with the, with a passion. Mm. Um, and yeah, I very much responded to this. Um, you, you got to see the iterations of Don Quixote. What, What did you think about that? That story of how many men had signed on and then been removed. It's incredible. I mean, just how many false starts and setbacks and disappointments, just one after another after another. Um, It's it's pretty amazing. Um, And and the the resilience this guy has to still be getting at it. It's pretty remarkable. I, I will bring up there's one thing this documentary actually ends before, and mm. that is distribution. Mm. Mm-hmm. This film, uh, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, originally had distribution through Amazon Prime, and then mm-hmm. it was dropped weeks before its release date. And I can't help but wonder what an amendment to this documentary mm. for 12 minutes or so of what that day to day was like for him and trying to figure out how they're going to recoup any of the budget that they spent on this film. Yeah, I don't even remember who did ultimately distribute it. I know it, it did get the I believe it was Fadley release. Events. Um, oh, wow. And, and, like, that type of a thing. It, it was an mm-hmm. excluded from A-list, excluded from Regal event mm-hmm. last year. Um, and I had to use a gift card that I'd had instead of being able to use my normal credits. Got it. You had to, yeah, yeah. So probably just, like, some limited one-off screenings. Yeah, limited yeah. engagement screenings. I think it was, like, a two week engagement in Linwood at 7 PM every night. And then mm. Regal probably had something comparable here in North Seattle, but it was, mm. it was a very limited engagement. Not all theaters had it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about just some of the different images we get of different attempts at the movie and sort of like some of the different 
qualities between versions, different um, styles between versions. But one of my favorite bits in the movie is the difference between the armor and costume they give the older lead, who the guy I forget that actor's name, Price. Jonathan Price. Um, the, the the costume they put together just looks cheap. It just does not look convincing. And then they finally track down from one of the older shoots what they had made um, in a, in a previous production, and it just looks like ten times better. It just looks so textured and detailed. Um, very satisfying to you know to see those little differences. Mm-hmm. Um, as someone who who watched the film, there's a lot of moments that seeing how they were made kind of brought me joy. Is there any moments that seeing get made brought you curiosity and like made you want to watch the film just to see what that final vision was like? Yeah, I mean quite a few scenes. I mean the the windmill stuff looked pretty funny. Most of the stuff with the giants seemed pretty amusing. Um yeah, I would say I would say most of it piqued my my interest. What about you? Well, well I guess you've seen it, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I thought it was most interesting to see um, him playing with the the broken glass and CDs to d- make the light dance mm. um, at a particular fulcrum violent moment fight um, in the film. Um, yeah, there's there's just so much. Seeing him uh, in the beginning, we don't spend much time with her uh, in the documentary, but seeing him cast Joanna Ribeiro and introduce Adam to her mm. and and his passing comment of just wait till you see what she looks like blonde, I thought was mm. so funny because she really does be almost become a different person, even though she's still herself, mm. um, which once you see the film, you'll understand why she needs to be two people in the film. Um, and that was my... Um, my favorite uh, actress uh, up and coming. Oh, right, last right. Year. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, on uh, yeah, the year end list. Yeah. So ju- just seeing her um, in in that moment before the film was made, uh, interacting with Adam was fun, and just seeing Adam the whole time was a pleasure. Yeah, he seems very agreeable throughout the production. No complaining. I mean, we don't really hear him talk at all, but he seems very much. He seems like he's going with the flow. Yeah, it was a solid set of shoulders to to put your character in. Um, yeah. there's one moment where Terry doesn't know what the scene is and he asks him what the first line is and Adam mm. just bounces it out without a thought. And that was just a great moment because Terry's hunched over, very defeated looking, beaten by, by the sun. I think he's lacing his hat with a leather strap. Um, and, and he just doesn't really, he's not surrounded by anyone and Adam's walking past and he asks him what the scene is. And Adam mm-hmm. just fires it right back. And I think that just shows how the group that he had on this one really helped him bring it about. Yeah, very much a collaborative effort, something he could not have done without the support of that group. So are you going to watch The Man Who Killed Don Quixote? It definitely made me more interested than I was before. Um, I guess it's just like kind of the general Gilliam sensibility that I just don't naturally gravitate towards. It's kind of weird to describe it because I haven't seen it, but it's just kind of like the over the top absurdist comedy. It's magical fantasy rather than magical Mm -hmm. realism. We're going to talk about magical realism in a dim valley, right? That's very much rooted in reality. What Mm -hmm. Gilliam does is he presents you with something fantastical, introduces magic on top of it, and then takes you to a faraway land. Um, Whereas just sensibility wise, you don't really engage with that much. Yeah, I I do tend to prefer things that are a little more grounded in reality, but that's not entirely true. Like David Lynch is one of my favorite filmmakers. He's an all out surrealist to some extent that does lean into darker territory. I think it's sort of this combo of comedy and um, absurdism and fantasy with the Gilliam stuff that just doesn't jump out to me quite as much but you know like anything it's kind of more about frame of mind and on the right day I would so um yeah I will have to we'll have to do like that kind of episode sometime and maybe that will help me get kind of in the mood for it when the green knight comes out Mm, let's let's do the man who killed Don Quixote and one other magical-esque title some sort of a classic film some kind of fantasy yeah yeah all right. All right. Do you, do you have a favorite scene? Do I have a favorite scene? I don't know. I, I, I did really like that costume switch. I thought that was very satisfying. Um, but you also mentioned what I think is the funniest thing, which is him 
you know, storming down this path when he can't get the, get, get the walkie talkie working. There's like a little part of him that kind of seems like, um, the kind of guy who would yell at the clouds when he's upset. Um, mm-hmm. you see that in, I think in, in moments like that. Um, yeah, funny stuff. It, it's kind of arbitrary to pick a favorite scene, but I'm just going to pick one that kind of shows the other side. Um, there's a moment where Jonathan Price is doing some scenes against the windmill as Don Quixote. And he he hits one that's going up and turns around and hits another that's coming up on him. And he falls to the ground. And Terry immediately becomes upset. And you think that he's getting mad at him um, for, like, ruining the scene. And then you find out that he's really worried about his friend's health because he has a bad back. And I think that is just such a touching little tiny scene mm. where you're you're kind of seeing the deeper parts of Terry because this is a man who he's worked with for or over the spans of years, you know, 40 years apart and just seeing him be upset that his friend almost got hurt on his project, I, I think was a very touching brief scene. Yeah. Yeah. I forget the name of the documentary that came out the same time as the other side of the wind was that last year or two years ago, but there was a documentary that, you know, detailed the making of that and everything. This kind of reminds me of that in spirit. You know, it, it feels like a little bit more than like, a bonus feature it's more than that it also doesn't feel entirely like it's to- like completely its own thing but just because it's inherently dependent on the other that's something that just i don't know it, i can't totally fall in love with something like that that doesn't totally stand on its own two feet that's just the nature of the thing but yeah, yeah. just a point of comparison i guess all right on to a dim valley all right a Dim Valley is di- uh, written and directed by Brandon Colvin, mm-hmm. if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, just to go back to plot, as you were describing it earlier, three dudes, two younger, one older from a university are conducting some kind of vaguely specified biological field, field research during a stay at a cabin in the woods. And they uh, encounter these kind of three mysterious women with whom they have some strange encounters what do you think of this film i haven't heard any indication of your reaction to it yet um i don't know it's it's an interesting movie in that there's moments where i am completely in it and then i fall out of it and i go why didn't you end it there Mm. um particularly the second to last scene where we have a steady cam shot, um, just stable tripod camera doesn't move the dead bodies in the boat. The, the women have already left. The boys are walking into the woods. They exit frame instead of Mm. ending there, it goes back and it gives you another shot comes up slowly on the canoe that the dead body was in goes into the canoe, shows you the, the flowers that were on the body and that the canoe is empty completely unnecessary in in my opinion like it it Mm. just it would have been a much more effective ending to end it that one scene briefer it was really reminiscent to me of like a kelly reichert film where it's just life moves on Mm. um and then it just kind of hits you over the head with the same message with a moving image rather than Mm. the image being static and the people moving and Mm. so that like undercuts it for me but then there's all these other things that i like so i that's a long way of saying i don't know i like it but i have a lot of problems Mm. um my favorite thing, undoubtedly, is the music. Oh, yeah. 100%. As soon as that score starts, right when the title cards are going, I'm like, ah, yeah, dog. I know what this is about. <laughs> 100%. I'm with you on that. I think I'm a little more confidently in favor of this one. I quite enjoyed it. That was pretty funny and, and interesting in a handful of different ways. Just kind of talking about the mood and tone of it in general it has this really dreamy atmosphere that really comes across from the lighting which is really this kind of bright and soft light that just kind of gives it this sun-drenched feel that i really liked and that combo of dreamy atmosphere with deadpan comedy i thought was kind of unique i don't think i've seen appearing quite like this before and i think it really pulled it off um i thought this was a kind of hilarious movie did the comedy land for you or not so much yes and no Mm. And, and two words you use there, I was stewing on all week. Moody and tone. You can't talk about this movie without its tone or how moody it is. The essence of the film is its mood. The essence of the film is its tone. There's moments where 
I kind of roll my eyes, but go along with it. Like when she picks out the shirt at the, um, at the shop after everything's been burned. And then they, they're all back in the same hotel room and she goes, my shirt's itchy and takes Mm. it off. thus initiating everyone having their clothes taken off where I roll my eyes, but go with it and have a good time. Mm -hmm. And there's other moments where they have their first encounter in the woods and they just disappear. That just didn't work for me. Um, Not that it made it worse. I just, I didn't really feel like it was fruitful to the continuing of the film. Fair enough. The actress you mentioned who makes a comment uh, about her shirt after buying it after a stop at a store, that her name is Feathers Wise, the actress that is, I thought she was hilarious. I did think she was great. Um, there are three three women. They're like, I don't think it's a spoiler to say these uh, these women are like forest nymphs or fairies or spirits or something like or that. Or muses because there's three of them. They're all mm. different tones of hair. Um, mm. I, I imagine probably blonde, brunette, red. Right. The okay. one we're talking about is the the blonde. Yeah, so um, so it's probably a play on for him on the three graces or something like that. Maybe he's using forest nymphs, maybe mm. water nymphs, who knows. But yeah, I there, thought, there's definitely a play on that. Yeah, for almost the entirety of the, the movie, she has this grin on her face that is so kind of like intense with her arched eyebrows too. It's this very almost like startling grin she has that i think is just so funny and she has these one-liners part of what is so funny about this movie is timing there can be these long awkward pauses that land kind of with one line or a punchline some of which work better than others i think she has some of the best ones um i thought she was great i really like all three um of the actresses i think the the guys are maybe a little weaker for me um i don't know if you have felt one way or another about the the uh cast yeah i think that the the cast members that are asked to do the most kind of end up suffering, right? Because the it, in a film that is best when it's just being moody, as soon as you have sensical dialogue introduced, it kind of undercuts its moodiness. And so mm. I think that the, the kind of feedback that that generates is whenever you have sensical dialogue, it undercuts whatever this kind of magical realist mood is is conjuring. Mm. There's a specific scene that is the crux of this film. That is the only time where that dialogue doesn't feel out of place. And that's the, um, the tarot reading at the dining room table. That's where like everyone's kind of engaging in a dialogue that feels real and of the time, but otherwise like even the, the dialogue when they're getting arrested for peeing in the lake is, it, it mm. kind of just goes against the grain of the moodiness of the film. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I would maybe kind of agree. I would say for me, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, you know, what's interesting about the music is that there is there is a great deal of silence in it too. You know, the musical moments are, are striking in part because they're on either side of um, scenes without music and these just long silences where people often aren't talking. Um, or the nature and, is yeah echoing. definitely and then the shoegazy dream pop comes in and, and is great um so yeah i think i'm i think i'm with you there i, re- I liked the tarot card uh scene quite a bit i think the actress who is sort of um uh leading that conversation that dialogue is pretty great there um she has a little bit more range i think than the other two mm-hmm. whose roles are a little bit more just narrow, I guess. Um, just grinny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I thought she was She has, like, good. a full spectrum of sadness to her as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for Which sure. very much goes against the other two, who really, like, the feathers, I, I think, maybe grimaces and, like, becomes um, kind of, and has a certain sense of animosity to her. The other one just kind of feels very um, devilish. Mm. But the the other actress you're referring to really has a full range where she can she can do that magical positive joy stuff, but then she gets to be the person who wakes up and knows that he's dead. Right, right. Um, in terms of just the meaning of the film, did you come away with it with any reading interpretation, um, or is it mostly about comedy and atmosphere? 
reading or interpret. I mean, it's. It certainly has a point that is a regurgitated point, which is that that life of, of all types moves on and that we are not nearly as special as we imagine ourselves to be. Interesting. I like it. Very, very different from mine. I guess I was kind of reading this as a story about two things, depending on which characters you're looking at. When talking about the two younger guys, this feels like for them... Maybe a story about kind of sexual awakening or self-acceptance. Um, it feels like these spirits are maybe gently guiding these two guys towards each other. And it finds both some emotion and comedy in that way. Um, and then the professor seems like he has some kind of unresolved um, romantic aspect of his life um, that he's working through. Um uh, yeah, so I don't know, something about how I think this does hit some pretty earnestly emotional beats within this really kind of dry, uh, quirky comedy. I think it's kind of interesting and effective. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that maybe what I said could be reductive if you're not me getting to the points that I was making, which is that the boys might not have been accepting their chemistry because mm. of how they perceive themselves, which we understand mm. is the reason why their teacher did not pursue that relationship that he had with that other man. Mm. Um, and, and so it's not taking yourself as seriously and thinking you're more important than you are. You're just a person. If these things mm. are true to you, do them um, because the context of why they weren't doing them appears to be mm. other people's judgment of what that would mean about them. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough. You know, this is uh, there isn't like much of a broader context for these three people. So, yeah, um, I think I see what you're saying. I think it's easy. Yeah, to you, assume you have that. to do a lot of leaning on the conversation that occurs in the driveway. If you At remember the very that's, beginning, uh, no, the specific conversation in the driveway near the end um, where the teacher is confronted by his ex lover. Oh, got it, got it, got it. And he basically alludes to all the reasons why there there's that fight that they have and why mm. they won't see each other again. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And that's certainly what I imagined. He was partially confronting when he was on the mountaintop with that six pack. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that seems very safe to say, especially because the professor's former lover we hear is married when he's singing the mm -hmm. song in the bar he says this is dedicated to my wife and mm -hmm. it clearly has additional significance and, for their and he, relationship he references his wife in the in the driveway yeah yeah um yeah for for the younger guys it maybe felt more to me because of the staging it felt more like discovery i suppose mm -hmm. um and it made me just rethink some of the early scenes once you kind of know where it's going in terms of those the relationship between those two guys some of the early scenes play a little bit differently like when it seems so insignificant at first that one of the guys falls off his like scooter in the driveway and scratches his knee and the other guy bandages him up and like as he's bandaging him the guy says how's that how's that feel and he says tighter in hindsight that feels like slyly erotic in a comical way because of where the story is going, um, which I think is really just clever well, um, I mean, scripting. Yeah. So to me, that was like the plainest foreshadow. I, I, did you know that they were having kind of that experience at that moment? Or, or did you not find out until later in the film? Well, at that point, you don't, you don't know. Like it, it is quirky. It certainly feels like it could be that way. I think it becomes very obvious when the blonde guy like he drops his pants at one time and he gets in the bed and the other guy has is is very is visibly aroused so mm -hmm. i'm not saying that the yeah. movie is like that um subtle after a certain point but i think that moment in particular at the moment seems like it could just be doing weirdo indie comedy um, gotcha well he has he has his leg kind of on the crotch of the other guy and he 
he asks him which one and he says the one that makes him cooler. Then he says tighter. Then when he gets up and says thank you, there's a very sensual touch. Close up, no faces, just the hand on the collarbone. Mm. The whole thing, the whole tone for me was just like, this is the foreshadow. Um, Mm. And I don't know if that's just too many stories that I've had where I just picked mm. up on that or, or if I just got lucky, but You're to me, it, than me, it was, it was very plain that like, this is a sensuality that they're either going to repress or explore as the film continues. And it's very much conducive to the vibe that both have, which is you don't in, encounter them and think that they're not possibly going to fall in love. You know, there's certain, there's a certain, ambiance to them that makes them feel like they may fall in love i think i would disagree i don't know that that was the experience i had i think that there i think the film is deliberately leading you that way i mean i think i see your point that maybe you are you are saying you are adept enough at reading it to to have seen it coming i don't know that i feel like the the film is trying to um uh point which path it's going to take all that clearly i think it's sort of deliberately vague where this is going exactly um i don't know I'll, I'll i think both are there. True. i think it tries to be vague but i think that knowing its own plot points the the way that the scenes are composed the music the the build all that stuff these characters specifically their magnetism towards each other i just i never saw it any other way so maybe it's just a me thing you're good <laughs> <laughs> um Anything else? Um, I really like when we linger in the nature mm. here. Um, I I think that if anything, there's not enough of that. Um, I I would rather substitute some of those scenes indoors in the cabin or whatever for just more time outside, walking among the trees, having some dialogue regarding the nature. But that's you know he, neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah. Some of the the light and atmosphere outside is kind of interesting because it looks kind of artificial. It looks like it's already a sunny day. And then on top of that, there's like this bright overhead light. Um, like I want to like zoom out sometimes and see like, how is this scene even being lit at the moment? Mm-hmm. It's really striking. Um, I like the professor's guitar playing. He's a good singer. Good yeah. song. Yes. That was yes. great. Nice moment. Um, yeah. I, I agree with all that. Do you have a favorite scene on this one? Ooh, do I have a favorite scene? Um, do you have one off the top of your head? I do not have one off the top of my head. I can guarantee that. I just thought of it, and I don't, but I'm going to stretch and talk and talk, and I'm going to say the being arrested for peeing in the lake. Mm. Because, like, you hear the siren, they come up on him, they tell him to put put it away. And you're like, okay, indecent exposure, slap on the wrist. Mm. Cut to wrists in handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, I think the professor says something like, keep this between us or something like that. Yeah. Once they're in the car, funny stuff. How, how about you? What's your favorite? <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. There are certain shots of the three women when you first encounter them that I think are just so funny because of the expression on that actress's face, feathers wise, which I think is just so amusing. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have a specific one, but certainly some of their uh, scenes are the funnier stuff. For I me. really thought you'd pick the tent catching it on fire. Mm. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to what Brandon does next. This definitely feels like an artist picking up momentum rather than stagnating. Um, and he has a certain Kelly Reichardt-esque to him that, that I'm very keen on. Good stuff, good stuff. On to Nafi's father. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Allah 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 Allah
Baba made you with him. So I want him. I feel like I should invest the Purkong. Nafi's Father, directed and written by Mamadou Dia, I believe. What'd you think about this one, Michael? I like this movie quite a bit. I should say at the beginning that I had a compromised viewing experience, which was just a bummer. I I had unfortunate internet connectivity during this viewing, which I think tempered my enthusiasm for a movie in a way that it's not its fault, so I should just throw that out there at the beginning. But I think I am very positive on this movie. What about you? Middle of the road. Three to a low three and a half. Okay, okay. Uh, a lot of promise I see in Mamadou Dia's direction. I think there's a lot of room for growth in screenplay, but I really like the the premise. I think that, that Mamadou has a good understanding of what a film could be made about, but I don't think the dialogue of this screenplay ultimately best serves the thing that he is attempting to communicate. I think I had the inverse reaction where I felt it, it felt very narratively rich to me. I liked the filmmaking. I don't know that there was anything about the f- his use of the camera that really stood out to me. Um, but I, I, I thought this was a, a very well written and interesting story. Um, I think you described the plot a little bit at the beginning. Did you? Should we talk about I, plot again? I did not. Let's talk about plot. Yes, yeah, so this is set um, in Senegal in a small town. Uh, we center on two brothers. Um, one is uh, a local, um, a, an imam at the local mosque. Mm-hmm. Uh, his brother is running for mayor. He might already be mayor. I forget if he's running for re-election or just running for election. Um, running for mayor. I believe the other individual. Oh, there's someone else who's mayor who always promises seeds, never delivers. Mm. And he's running to be mayor and is giving seeds now. Got it. And... The children, um, the the imam's name is Tierno, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. The um, Nafi's poten- father is Tierno. Exactly. The the potential mayor is Usman. Uh, Usman's son and Nafi's daughter want to get married, and that uh, stirs up conflict between um, their two families. Um, not for the reasons that we would think of either. Not so much. Um, Usman is loosely affiliated, or maybe that's an understatement, um, with um, uh, extremist groups, um, more, a, a more radical form of Muslim, whereas Tierno adheres to a more um, uh, nonviolent traditional form of Islam. Or tr- traditional might not be the word, but certainly not radical a, a Islam. A more broad, contemporary, you might say, Islam, in which women do not have to cover themselves or act differently or... More flexible, for sure. Or be told what to do and obey and not leave the house, whereas the the Sikh, or Sheikh, sorry, the Sheikh who's come in, who is backing Usman, is bringing the true Islam. Mm. Um, And that is women have to wear coverings, obey men um and it it basically slowly turns visually into like a totalitarian rule yeah got it um yeah so like part there i mean i think there are a handful of things going on which i really like that there are i think you know a handful of different aspects to this movie but one of the conflicts that is sort of central is uh tierno's not wanting his daughter to get um subjected to or even mixed up in the extremism that Usman um, is following and adhering to. But at the same time, uh, his daughter does truly want to marry this boy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's just a great premise. And the the fact that we're following both his, either brother's attitude toward these different forms of Islam um uh, I keep wanting to say Nafi's father, Tierno's concern for his daughter, just the parental concern, um, the sibling, sibling rivalry aspect of it, the kind of the before and after um, of extremism actually creeping into this town. I think there's like quite, I think it's a fairly dense screenplay. It's more about like just how compelling the filmmaking is for me. 
Um, but it sounds like the opposite for you. Yeah, I think the characters are dense. And I think that you're getting it like some very dense elements of the screenplay, the the, the sibling rivalry, cousin, first cousins attempting to marry for like heartfelt reasons, um, Tierno's poor health, diabetes, um, the this side story almost to his wife never really leaving that house and the confrontations she has where she's fat. Like there's, there's a lot of beats, but I think that it, it depends on how you view a screenplay, but the, the word part, the dialoguing, I think was very ineffective here. I think that mm-hmm. a lot of passive screenplay writing here was good. The character build, the idea of the village slowly becoming its own idea, the repetition of the funerals, that mm-hmm. type of thing. Th- there's some sharp stuff. But I think over the runtime, there's enough on definition. There, there's enough fogginess to actually understanding what is occurring that the screenplay mm-hmm. must, it, it has to be, not as optimal as it could be or else you and I both wouldn't have had the confusion that we did during our viewing experience as we Mm. slowly came to the end where we did figure stuff out. And it wasn't like a designed build up to increase your intrigue and slowly reveal these things. It was just kind of an ineffective way of communicating who these people are and, and what their true ambitions are. And I think that um, I, I'm not saying that this is a poor screenplay writer, but that there's a lot of growth on the dialogue part that needs to mm. occur. But the character, the plot, that type of stuff, the passive story, you're absolutely right. It It is very well wrought. Yeah. To clarify about what I thought was perhaps confusing or could be confusing is the fact that Tierno, to, to my eye, just looks young. And given the title of the movie, he does. You say he father. Looks very, you very, just, very young. You just expect somebody older. So and, I think and it's, his wife looks much older than him. Uh, Tierno's wife. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. And um, his his daughter arguably looks to be within the same generation of him. Fair, um, but I mean, I don't know. Scenes where Usman and his son come over to Tierno's house and they sit underneath you know a little canvas and talk about the marriage Mm -hmm. it's it's very clear that like those are their children yes right yes yeah it's yeah i i'm not saying those specific things i think there's just an there's a of a dark valley of dialogue that doesn't exist in this film that would be better than a large portion of what is in it i think that there's a, a lot more clarity that could be provided at different plot points and beats to make people understand. But that could also be poor subtitles because there are Mm. extended chunks of this film where there are prayers uttered and other things where there is zero English subtitles given. Mm. And there is dialogue going back and forth where there is, you know, maybe a quarter of what I hear them saying actually is printed Mm. out on the screen. So it it is hard to say since I, I, I'm not a native of Senegal, so I don't really know what's being said. Yeah. Um, for me, maybe it was performance that that made up for um, any absence of, of dialogue that would have added clarity. Like, I think, you know, the the actor who plays Tierno, like, has this very clearly solemn uh, presence and is clearly very disheartened and worried. And it's in clear contrast to Usman's arrogance and cockiness which just comes through his smirk and like general kind of swagger um and yeah i I don't know i think the the interest and motivation seem clear enough just because of how they react to things um and once the extremism actually arrives in this village i think the severity and um uh, issues with that, the very tragic issues with that are very clear. Yeah, yeah. The, that's where the screenplay's very good because visually we're slowly seeing the animus of this violence and control and militantism take shape in a very undefined way. Um, you, you don't really understand what's happening at any clear point. Uh, I think the clearest might be that utterance of the true Islam. 
and, and then mm-hmm. Tierno's reaction w- where he's very animated and retorting mm-hmm. back about does it mean this is different does it mean this is different does it mean this is different trying to underline that like what what you're doing is wrong in, in mm-hmm. his own way um yeah it, it was very stirring i i thought in great comparison to this um over the last day um between this and uh, young Ahmed, which I think also mm. shows a, a slow graduation into radicalism that is not, um, that, that the individual who's being radicalized is not actually coherently responsible in many ways of this radicalization. Mm. And I, I do find myself liking more the, the young Ahmed route where there's a kind of clearer build um, through dialogue than what occurs here i i do find it much I, I find it very interesting not more interesting to see an entire village kind of slowly come under this rule in a gradual um slippery slope way but mm. i i think i did respond more to young ahmed as uh, as a film yeah i mean i i certainly think the dardens are better just visual filmmakers right like that kinetic fluid handheld camera that they always have um is is very compelling i think there are moments that don't work for me very well and nafi's father like when tierno who has this heart condition or illness of some kind i think it's a heart condition um he also has diabetes yeah that's right um you know he'll be staggering through the village and uh dia adds a bit more kind of dramatic emphasis with some music and these kind of wide angle close-ups as he's stumbling. Oh, you didn't stumbling. like the wide-angle close-ups. I didn't, uh, well, I did not find some of those scenes very persuasive. Um, I, I, they just did not work for me, no. I think I agree. So you're saying that they didn't convince you? Yeah, I think, but, I think the visual language of this film is very grounded in static shots, more kind of a tableau style of of representation and then it will have these moments of movement where it's kind of picturing his um you know stumbling and that kind of thing and yeah they're just moments that uh didn't work didn't land for me did they look bad though um I, they didn't look bad they didn't look good they just Okay. didn't convince there, me i guess i don't know if we're talking about different things or if we just have a totally different read but there's certain moments i i don't think it's just him where there's people walking through the village or whatever and he'll he'll do like a, a face close-up takes up one third of the screen whether it's left center right um and mm. the the back is like very um kind of extravagantly shadowed um underlit like a great sunset esque vibe and i i just thought that i saw a lot of unique like um shots that if i were to like pause that and print out a photo it would be very beautiful but i thought that within the film itself didn't really fit and that's kind of that's Mm. part of where i feel like there's a lot more to develop here that this is a directorial debut in in a feature film um so i i don't want to be too harsh but i between the screenplay and the timing of those really good shots. I think that if you put those shots in differently, it would just make a better film. Yeah. I I do think it's often beautiful, especially just because of beautiful cultural detail. There's a lot of color in, in clothing. There's a lot of ornate kind of um, wardrobes and that all just look natural. And just like what people would be wearing. It feels like this is, these feel like non-actors just living their lives. um, And, the framing of all that is often quite beautiful for sure. I I do want to say that I think that as a directorial debut, the most impressive thing about this is that the performances felt so natural. I would agree. I I did not ever come out of this film thinking, or, or, you know, while I was watching, I didn't stop feeling like I was in the film because this person's overacting, underacting, unable to deliver the line, unconvincing. Every single thing felt naturalistic and real. Yeah, I would completely agree. Um, very convincing. Um, anything else you want to get into? I don't think so. You? Favorite scene? Favorite scene? Um, I don't know that I have one jumping out. I'm just flubbing the favorite scene questions today. Um, a lot of these kind of blend together. Like When, these, when your um, internet worked? Yeah, exactly. Maybe it's, you know, that there's there's no... 
there aren't too many changes of scenery here. We are uh, in one particular village and moving kind of from, from house to house. Um, it, it, always, it honestly feels like less a movie um, of really striking individual scenes that stand out versus just one kind of big thing. Um, yes. Uh, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I will step back in for you, but um, I, I'll, I alluded to it earlier. I will go with the thing that, that I find most um, heroic and engaging a scene in the film, and that is when Tierno, the imam, confronts him after saying, after his brother says uh, this thing about true Islam and, and fights him on it, making these, these points about how basically you don't get to say that. Mm. Um, and that, that, that's just one of those quiet moments of heroism that, y- you know, you see that in a movie like A Hidden Life, where he just will not join the Nazis. You, mm. you see the, the same here. Like, there's just, there's certain uh, groups that, that are bad um, that you see these small moments of heroism where someone just won't back down and agree to something that is false. And watching Tierno do that, I, I think, was my favorite scene. I like it. I did think of one. Thank God. I like the very early scene where Tierno is presiding over a wedding. It is not his daughter's. And Mm -hmm. that is where Usman steps up just after the ceremony has kind of completed and kind of steals the mic. If there was a mic there from Tierno and says that his daughter and or his son and Tierno's daughter will be getting married. And I think you get everything you need to know about that brotherly relationship in those moments where Usman's kind of swagger and um, insecurity in a way because of his his wanting to just steal the spotlight in this moment and upstage his brother um, immediately comes across. And it's just a beautiful scene because of all the color and detail in what everyone's wearing to this funeral. I like just the cultural specificity of all that. Agreed. All right. That was an episode about Rain Dance 2020 in the UK. Till next time. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant. You're the best and we love you! And that's another one in the can.